Hi, my name is Dr. Luke Garn, and I'm a research fellow at the Australian Red Cross Lifeblood and an adjunct senior research fellow at La Trobe University in Melbourne. Uh, this talk is going to explore our experiences at Lifeblood using the co-design methodology to work with ethnic minority communities in Australia to develop strategies to encourage more blood donation. In particular, I'm going to talk through the method we use on the Polynesian Australian co-design project. I've been fortunate enough to be joined on that project with Professor Barbara Messer and Kyle Jensen. So this talk is going to focus mostly on how we did the research and why we believe other researchers and organisations may benefit from doing similar work using this methodology. I'll also share some of our early findings. So for a few years now, uh, we've, Lifeblood has had difficulty meeting the increasing demand for a blood type known as JKA minus B minus. From the data available right now, we know that people in, in, with Polynesian ancestry have the highest frequency of this blood type, ranging from around 0.1% among those with Maori ancestry through to 1.4% of people with Nguyen ancestry. So it is still a rare type, even among communities where it's the most frequent. The number of people in Australia with Polynesian ancestry is growing fast. Between 2006 and 2011, we saw a 38% increase. So that's quite a steep increase. For those watching this outside of Australia and New Zealand and not sure where Polynesia is, it is an area of the Pacific Ocean that includes over 1,000 islands, often referred to as the Polynesian Triangle, and it goes all the way from Hawaii in the north to Aotearoa, New Zealand in the south and Easter Island in the east. It is made up of a number of ethnic and cultural groups and many different nations. So Australia is quite a close neighbour to Polynesia. But while the number of people in Australia with Polynesian ancestry continues to go up, we've not seen this increase amongst those who are on our blood donor panel. Likewise, uh, as the community continues to grow in Australia, we've seen a continuing demand, increase in demand for this rare blood type. Uh, due to the lack of availability of JKA minus B minus blood in Australia, Lifeblood has also often had to import blood from abroad, usually, usually from New Zealand. Uh, and this is not an ideal situation. Um, as we've seen with COVID, the logistics of transporting things around the world are easily impacted by global events. So as at December 2019, we had just 10 active donors of this type in Australia. And when you think about how many blood donations people can make a year and the various things that can prevent someone from being able to donate at any given time, uh, 10 is really not enough to be able to make sure we have adequate supply. So in the past, Lifeblood has done a number of call outs to the media to help raise awareness of the need for this blood type. Unfortunately, it largely hasn't generated the desired response. Um, either we haven't had as many people come forward to donate or we haven't had enough and therefore um, haven't found many of the rare blood donors. Many of those identified as rare donors have been family members of patients who require the blood. Our previous work at Lifeblood had indicated that we needed to talk to non-donors. A previous project had um, talked to donors with Polynesian ancestry, so people who actually are donating blood, but it was clear that um, it is the people who actually don't donate that we really need to engage with. And our research indicated that we needed to find a way to work with communities to create these solutions. So co-design was seen as a really good fit for this. Co-design research really shifts the traditional roles of the researcher, the researched and the designer. On the next slide, I'll share a great graphic which depicts this. There is no one set method of doing co-design yet, but the core principle underpinning co-design is the involvement of end users and their experiences in the design process, focusing on better understanding of challenges and issues from the perspective of end user and the design solution. Um, for perspectives of the end user and designing solutions to improve the person's experience of a product service, as well as the product service itself. So importantly, when the, uh, the, when the spirit of the method is followed closely, participants are embedded in the design of the solutions and the researchers will work with them in a partnership, recognizing along the way that the participants are the experts, not the researcher. 
In Australia, co-design is increasingly used with patients to design healthcare services and government departments in our state of Victoria, where I live, often require researchers to design and deliver responses in partnership with stakeholder communities. The reason for this is because proponents argue that the method can enhance the likelihood of service uptake, often simply because it has been designed by the very people who we want to take up the particular message or service. It has also been shown to help uh, engage hard to reach communities and gain their support for change. To put simply, the method forces you to engage people and by working with them, letting them know that you see them as an expert rather than a research subject, they are more likely to be involved and feel ownership of the problem or solution. Likewise, the very nature of the method fosters cooperation and if done well, can help build trust between different groups. Something that is, incredi is incredibly important when working with minority communities. Most importantly, because you relinquish some of the control as the researcher, you can find that the method allows for the generation of more in innovative ideas, which hopefully will then ensure that the things you make design or come up with will match the needs of the end user. So this graphic from Sanders and Stapers kind of demonstrates what the method is all about. In a classical or traditional research, model, the end user takes a passive role and is the object of the study. They are the research subject. So, you know, we might be observing them, we might be interviewing them, uh, we might get them to do surveys. Likewise, the researcher is armed with knowledge from theories and, and all the literature and develops more theory knowledge by interviewing and observing the user. So the researcher then uh, generally brings all this together in a report that is presented to a designer who then uses their um, own creative thinking to generate new ideas, proposals and concepts. And so they translate the research for the, um, on behalf of the participants and actually often the participants never actually know what comes of their work. In a co-design process, the end users, in our case, the Polynesian communities, they are the expert of their own experiences and play a critical role in the development of knowledge and the concept development, while the researcher and designer, often the same person, supports the end user by providing tools for the ideation and the expression of new ideas. Researchers like end users will bring with them their own experiences, knowledge and theory. However, unlike traditional research where the theory informs the researcher's examination of a participant, in co-design the theory is brought to the table and shared with the users and designers who equally inform the research and design process. I've been involved in co-design projects a few times, all of which have involved lots of hand-on, hands-on face-to-face workshops, big pieces of paper, like in Australia we call butcher's paper, with people drawing pictures, writing mind maps and sharing ideas. Usually we have a facilitator at the front of the room collating things, um, and of course lots of tea and biscuits. Well, unfortunately, thanks to our friend COVID, we couldn't do that uh, this past year. And so we had to pivot to online workshops using Zoom. Um, and I'm happy to take lots of questions around how we did that. Um, and I will address a bit of that today as well. So how do we do our co-design other than just being on Zoom? Well, in this slide, I'll give you a bit of an overview of the three phases of the project um, and the two groups of participants we had. So we broke the project up into three phases. The research design phase, the workshop phase, and the response phase. The research design phase was not just involving us as researchers. Some of our participants actually helped us design many aspects of this project. So the co-design began at the actual designing of the methodology. So in this phase, we pulled together a group of 10 stakeholders from the community. This group became known as the Stakeholder Advisory Group, or the SAG and is made up of key community members, elders, and Polynesian Australian lifeblood staff. Now you could pull together various different types of SAGs. Um, and sometimes, well, from my experience, participants in that group will actually say, hey, we haven't got the right people here at the table. Why don't you go off and include this person? Or why don't you contact this organization and get them to send a representative? Um, this time around, we actually did really well. Um, as I'll probably say a little bit later on, um, down the track, participants actually said, hey, I know someone who needs to come onto this SAG, can we bring them on? And we went with that as well. So while you may start off putting together a group, they might actually themselves start to realize that others need to be involved. Um, and so the aim for this group is that for it to guide the project from start to finish. 
We recruited this group by contacting key community organisations such as rugby clubs and church groups. We also reached out to our staff and recruited a couple of staff members who had Polynesian ancestry. Some of the group had donated blood previously or still do, others never had um, and had never even thought of it. Um, so the, the knowledge was of blood donation was quite a big range. The goal was to find people who could help us best understand how to do the project with their community and to help us access people to work with. The idea being we build trust and relationships with this small group of people who can then help us reach out more to the community. In this phase, the SAG helped us to understand the problems we wanted to solve um, and helped us to work out the best way to solve it within their communities. This group, uh, this, group, this group guided the research process from the start by driving participants recruitment and teaching us how to run workshops within the community. Then in the later phases, they helped us to understand and inform what we had discovered after the workshops. So this group of arm um, took ownership of the project from the start. The next phase was the workshop phase. Um, and this included uh, three co-design workshops, all done virtually with the community using Zoom. Being online, we were able to include people from all over the country and therefore had a diverse range of views. So going online actually ended up being quite a benefit. The SAG played a major role in recruiting participants and I'll go into this in more detail in a couple of slides. So we managed to, um, in those three workshops, um, we actually reduced the numbers a little bit. You can have more people when you're in a room um, with COVID. Um, you either can't have anyone in a room or you have to have restricted numbers and people can't be so close to each other. Um, so um, on a Zoom, it worked out really well to have around 25, um, sorry, around um, between five to 10 each time. But over our three workshops, we had a total of 25 participants, 15 female, 10 male, seven different Pacific Island ethnicities were represented, which is really great. Three of the participants were born in Australia and had Polynesian ancestry. 22 were born abroad, eight were current donors, seven had never donated, eight were lapsed donors, so may have donated in the past, whether in Australia or another country, um, and two had only donated abroad. So we began with our first SAG during the research design phase. We then had our first workshop with the community and this was followed by a second SAG where we came together to discuss what we had heard, chat about what went well in the workshop and what we could do better the next time, including if things needed to, be, to make changes to recruitment or design um, for our workshops. The SAG helped us to understand and confirm what we had learned in the workshops and guide us on what, if anything, needed to change. We then had workshop two and three before going into our response phase with the final SAG meeting. And I'll talk more about the response phase later. But that is part of, um, the, that is a part of the project where it all begins to really come together. When we went into the first SAG meeting, we had some ideas about how we thought the project was gonna work, but really the idea was to get them to provide as much input into the project design as possible. In other words, our participants co-design the research methods themselves. So after some icebreakers and getting to know everyone at the SAG, we had a short presentation where we explained to the group what the project was all about and what we were trying to achieve. This is one of the slides we showed during our SAG meeting. So we asked things like, who should we include in the three workshops to best represent the communities? Who should, we, how, who should we contact to find people? Can you help? When should we hold the workshops? So what day and time? Uh, what things should we ask about or investigate? When they break into groups, is there anything you'd recommend to get people um, to give us the most information? Are there cultural things we should be aware about doing this research? Um, sometimes there are things such as sensitivities, community politics that you may not be aware of that they need to let you know. Like it might be like, you know, don't let this person sit next to this person or make sure you in, make sure you acknowledge these people when they come in and things like that. So a couple of those things were given to us as really great tips um, around how to do workshops, like acknowledging elders in the room by name. Um, and I'll talk about about that here too. So out of the first SAG, a number of suggestions were made by participants that we immediately incorporated into our project design. They provided amazing insight on how to recruit people to the three workshops and actually how to organize and facilitate the workshops themselves. They also told us, by the way, how to, um, 
how long the workshop should be. Um, and for this one, they surprisingly told us that two hours was quite fine. Uh, they said, uh, to have it in the evening, maybe have a day one, but we did find that evening turned out to be better. So two of the three workshops were actually in the evening. So uh, when we went to the first uh, SAG meeting, um, so, so the SAG actually co-designed the recruitment of the workshop participants. Um, and that was something that we were really thrilled with. We didn't think we were gonna have this much help. And the following is what they came up with. Keep in mind, this is specifically for the Polynesian communities in Australia. The findings here could be very different for other communities in other places. So for this community, the SAG all agreed that recruitment was going to be best if it came from them, not us. If we spoke to another ethnic minority community, they may well have actually said that the message would come better from you guys. You look like, you know, you give it a different amount of credit. But for this community, they said, no, you may be, um, you know, it needs to come from our own people. So our SAG also said, you know, you can send out some emails to current donors who we know were born in Polynesia, but they suggested that we would have more luck recruiting both donors and non-donors if we gave it to them to do. Um, so they came, they wanted to come up with a video um, and they also told us that we should include that in the email, which we did. And the way they suggested this be done was through a video that they designed and put together in their voice by their people, for their people. We could then put a link to the video in our email, but they believed that we would have more success if we allowed them to put the video out through their own uh, social networks or emails um, for community groups. Um, and they were actually right. Uh, our email generated very little interest compared to um, their um, social media posts. In fact, there was a participant who got the email as a donor, didn't do anything with it, and then saw a post on social media from one of their community members and then contacted us to be involved. Uh, sorry, so this is what I was just been saying. So they wanted it by them for them in their own voice. They told us to link it to family and community. They wanted to have a lot of humor in it. Uh, they said we should talk about football. We should have some sort of competitive edge to it. So there was a bit of competition with New Zealand uh, and talking about football. They actually said to mention the rare blood type. We did wonder if that was something we should um, not bother to mention, but they said, nope, go with it. Um, they said to, to use the Lifeblood logo and branding to help build trust within their community to show that we're actually working with them. So they're asking for people to come forward and be a part of the study, but it's actually with us that it's happening. And so the video was uploaded by the SAG to their socials um, and community groups. Um, this was very popular um, and following uh, so we recruited participants really easily um, and following the video, um, the SAG themselves received really great feedback from their communities um, and really it generated calls to the uh, to the call centre at Lifeblood to donate as well. So some people saw it online rather than actually wanting to sign up to be in the study, they just rang straight up and said, hey, can we donate blood? I saw the video, um, which we were really surprised with. And uh, funny enough, um, by the time we actually contacted the call center to say, hey, this video is going out, um, they had already in the 20 minutes the video had gone out, started receiving phone calls before we'd even had a chance to let them know. Um, so it began conversations in the community on social about blood donation, which was um, quite amazing. Um, after the video went out, the SAG advised us to start using the word Pacific Islanders rather than Polynesian in future. Um, so this was something that they got feedback from their own communities. And these recruitment lessons we learned from recruiting participants are also data for um, that we can use in later donor recruitment. So, um, so here is, uh, I'm going to show you the video that we used, that they made, um, and that was used to recruit participants. Kiora, aloha, talofalava, kiorana, malolele, pulavinaka, fakalofa atu, get a mate, true bro, get a mate. For the most common Pacific Island greeting of all, the Australian Red Cross Lifeblood are looking for people from the Pacific Island and Māori community to be a part of one of their research projects. All you need to do is be part of a one-off two-hour workshop where they'll ask questions like, why do you and your family donate blood? Or most importantly, why don't you and your family donate blood? Why that is really important is that we have a very rare blood type. Mm -hmm. 
But that means if one of us needs blood, either through illness, an accident, or an operation, it's really hard to find here in Australia because very few of us actually donate blood, which means we have to go elsewhere like New Zealand to get the blood. They've really got Chinese Nations Cups, Blizzlow Cups, World Cups, and we've got to go to them as well for blood. As a community, it is ingrained in us, the Pacific Island and Māori people, to help each other. So let's do the same here. Help us collect the data for the Australian Red Cross lifeblood so that they can help our tokos, our usos, our whānau, our koro, our family, our parents, our grandparents, our uncles, and you know we've got to help our aunties, our brothers and sisters, and all of the cousins. Register now so that we can help them help us. So that video uh, was made by the participants uh, and we helped them put it together in a little bit. And, and it, there was probably a couple of back and forward uh, suggestions for edits and things. Um, but overall, it was really much a co-design process for this video um, to help actually recruit participants. Um, so the SAG was also pivotal in helping us co-design how we would do the data collection, as I said before, so how we would do those workshops. And again, these findings are particular to the communities we were co-designing with. And if we did this with another community, we would have a very different uh, method probably suggested. So our SAG really helped us to know how to run workshops and what to ask or focus on. While we are all experienced researchers, I do not believe we would have got anywhere near as rich data if we had designed the data collection methods ourselves. Using co-design right down to the research method level is so incredibly valuable, in particular when working with minority communities. So if you are going to do co-design, I really recommend that you um, get the participants in, a, in however you do it, you might want to create a SAG and get them to help you really um, nut down what the method's going to look like. So uh, the participants told us, uh, the SAG told us that we need to have community members facilitate the breakout rooms to create safe space, uh, trust and ensure culturally appropriate communication. Uh, here's one of the quotes, it said, you're bringing a white person into a cultural world asking questions, is it worthwhile having facilitators of Polynesian background? They asked us to have prayer at the beginning um, and end of workshop, following, uh, and it follows community norms, builds trust um, and brings them together. Uh, so the quote was, one of the quotes here is, because faith is such a strong thing for Polynesians, commencing something with a prayer, not specifically you, but asking somebody if they would like to say a prayer on behalf of the group, that helps bind people uh, together, um, is the structures that we use to and we're used to, and what is normal in our communities, will then have um, that buy-in. Uh, they told us to really get to understand why the communities do and do not, do not donate from the participants, find out what they actually know or do not know about blood donation and transfusion. Um, and we realised very quickly that all these lessons apply to how we can recruit, retain and engage donors down the track. Um, so members of the SAG uh, volunteered to run the breakout rooms at the workshops. And we would begin the workshops uh, ourselves as researchers, we'd welcome everyone. Um, and it suggested ask someone to do a prayer for us. Sometimes this was the SAG members who had come along to facilitate. Other times it was one of the workshop participants themselves who put their hand up to pray. The prayer was pivotal part of the workshop. We began and ended them with prayer. Uh, it is something that we would never have thought of um, thought about to do, let alone considered having it a traditional focus group. The SAG said it would create a safe space for participants and make the virtual room feel like it was part of their community. Um, it was a community gathering after all, and that actually uh, gave it that feeling. They said they begin and end every community gathering that they go to generally in that way. And so we should do it at our workshop to create that same sort of place. Make the workshop, workshop uh, their space, uh, not the researcher's space. So this suggestion was really a great example of what co-design can generate when you allow participants to co-design the method with you. The prayer really worked and looking at the video recordings, you can actually see uh, the people are all involved at that moment. Um, and some people are really surprised when we start to do it. Um, not that they're surprised because they're shocked that we would do such a thing, surprised that we, we knew to do such a thing. Um, and, uh, and we had feedback from participants saying how great it was that that was part of it.
Um, and it had the desired effect. People really opened up and relaxed like I'd never seen before at a traditional focus group. We broke up into smaller breakout rooms, uh, which Zoom enables really well. Think of these as separate round tables in a big community hall. We would then come back to the larger group and share what was discussed in those rooms and we'd have a bit of a chat. We did this several times during the two hour workshop. Each breakout room had a SAG member facilitating as recommended, and I would go in and out of the rooms uh, in case people needed me. But largely it was clear when you watch the video uh, that when I go into the room, it becomes much more serious and not as free flowing. Um, and the moment I leave the room is when the data really flowed freely again. Um, and again, that's something we can thank co-design for because had we not known to do that with our, um, have, have the stakeholders actually run those groups, we probably wouldn't have got the rich data that we had while we were not in that space and in that room. Um, and so by the time we got to the third workshop, I, I went in and out of the room very, very minimally during the whole um, co-design process. So here are some of our findings. I'm only going to touch on them today as the purpose of this presentation is really to highlight the method more than anything. But I can't stress enough that our findings are really the result of a co-design process that has, been, um, has uh, generated such great understanding. So they told us there were three themes to what we really needed. There were three main themes about what we really need to work on to do to target and work with their communities down the track. So that's really education, having targeted materials, videos, community events, festival, uh, so go to festivals, go to their churches, um, go to the footy games. Um, and really to use the community to talk to other community members, like you saw in the recruitment of participants, getting the community to go out and help us to recruit those donors um, and that that message is going to come and that education will come from their community um, rather than us. So educate people in the community to then go on and educate others. Uh, one of those quotes was, having someone share their story is so powerful, having those testimonials is important, donors and recipients. So they really wanted us, they want us to go out there and gather some testimonials from people who are donors um, as well as recipients, but in particular they were talking about people who donate so that we can normalise this idea of donation in their community. Trust was very important. Uh, and so that's, again, involving the community in the messaging, uh, get elders, sports players, and ministers of religion to actually talk about blood donation. And this will then create trust both in Lifeblood as an organization, but in the entire process and idea about blood donation. They want us to continue working with the community very much in a co-design way, uh, and, that's, uh, and to continue this process. Um, they want us to have donation events for their communities, which will then help them to later on go in and donate on their own. Um, and to facilitate some way of having buddy donations so people can go in with their friend. Uh, as you can imagine, if you, if you haven't donated before, you, you want to have someone, you may want to have someone with you. Um, and as they said to us multiple times, going in with another Polynesian friend makes the space Polynesian rather than them going in and being the one Polynesian person in a, in a very uh, white room of other blood donors. Uh, so here's a great quote, you can have the best degree in marketing and social media, but if you don't have a coconut connection and the understanding of what we're about and you get that wrong, you'll be wiped off the trust list. Uh, so by coconut connection, they're meaning a connection with the community, actually having someone in the community who can spread that message for you. Normalize was really important. So they said to normalize the, the whole idea of blood donation through elders, famous people, religious leaders, to show community members donating, as I said before, images, videos, share donor stories and testimonials, um, and have lifeblood actually uh, actively take part in the Polynesian island communities, have a visual presence. Uh, Pacific Island is seeing a famous Polynesian doing anything, um, everything, everyone will jump behind them and support them. There's a sense of pride. You'll be more inclined to listen. Uh, so this is where we are now, the final phase of the project. It's a very important phase. Uh, so we collated the findings of the workshops, as did the community facilitators who joined us. We then took them to the wider SAG as a presentation. Good to point out that during this time, a member of one of the workshops asked to join the SAG and the SAG actually said, hey, we need this person on the SAG. And so this is where we actually added someone. The SAG provided feedback on what we had found through the workshops and gave us more insight into some of the things we had heard, clarifying things that we may have um, not necessarily interpreted com correctly or that we were unsure of. In other words, they co-analyzed the data with us. 
So we presented the findings to them. Uh, we then presented the findings to an internal stakeholder committee. So people at Lifeblood itself in various divisions. Um, and right now, the, these stakeholders are working with us to bring to life some of these recommendations of the workshops in the SAG. Um, and we respond to the, uh, we will then respond to these recommendations, putting the code back into co-design. So there are things that we will end up doing um, as part of the design process. Um, and if any of those recommendations are not possible, then we'll clearly explain that to people and propose some alternatives. Um, the SAG will always ultimately approve or send things back to us and say, no, you need to do this. Um, largely so far, we've got things spot on, which is great, um, but a couple of times they'll give some feedback and we can alter them. When consensus is reached, which we've actually found really easy in this process, designs can be implemented. So I want to give you a really good example, and I've probably gone over time here, but I have no track of time on, on this Zoom recording system. Um, but I really want to give you um, a great example here of one of the items for implementation. So um, the first thing we did was a national call out for Pacific donors in Australia. And it was no coincidence that while we were still conducting our workshop, Lifeblood had three patients who needed JKA minus B minus, and there was not enough supply in Australia. So we pushed forward part of that response phase um, very quickly by building a national call out based on the workshop findings. Um, and again, this is where we worked with the SAG to bring to life those findings. Uh, the workshop findings really changed the way we did our call out. It was very different to previous years. Uh, it wor we worked with SAG to design a video for social media, quite similar to the one we did for recruiting participants, because the feedback from the workshops was, that's what you need to do to get people to donate. Do something similar to that. Get the same guy in that video to help you. So it was made by them, the SAG, again, with our help. Um, and it was in their voice, talking to their people. Uh, so here's one of the great quotes about that. For our people, it's got to be a little bit funny. There's got to be, uh, uh, there's got to be a little bit of laughter in there and it's got to be relative and real. There's nothing more compelling than somebody who just looks like you. So that, again, wanting to have that message come from someone who looks like themselves. So we did, and I'm going to share that video with you, which will probably push me over time, but it's really worth watching. Um, we posted the video on uh, Lifeblood's Facebook page on April 8th. Um, and as of May 31, there were over 82,000 viewers just of the Lifeblood, Lifeblood Facebook post and video alone. There was 1.1 thousand likes of that post, 1.9 thousand uh, shares, 294 comments and the, what's important there is many of those were comments tagging their Pacific Islander friends in those comments. 221 people signed up to the Lifeblood Team Pacific Donor. So they signed up to donate. And since that time by March 30, uh, sorry, May 31, we've had 128 donations have occurred, 82 of which were whole blood, which helps us to collect um, and phenotype blood. Really exciting thing was, and this is quite unusual, is that we actually have found three JKA minus B, B minus blood donors from that one call out. Um, and an additional two were found during the actual study recruitment call out. So that very first video that I showed you before, um, those people who then called up the call center rather than participating and said, oh, I actually just want to donate. Um, some of those people um, Two of those people uh, were actually JK, A minus, B minus. So all up, five people have been located. Um, and that's quite an incredible result um, in terms of the actual rarity of this blood type. Again, this video was then shared and reshared on other platforms. It was on YouTube as well. And so it had even more viewers on each of those individual ones. So our people are very visual people. We will watch it before we would read it. That's why the video was brilliant, was the feedback. So here is a the three minute video that actually went out that we were just talking about that went out on social media platforms. G'day to all my Pacific Island and Maori people out there, or in our language. This is an urgent call out. We need your donations. We don't need your money. We don't need your food. And we definitely don't need your old school rugby stories. When I was a kid, I was the best rugby player. When I come to Australia, they ring me. They want me to play for the Wallabies. Dad. You were 47 when we arrived. <laughs> we need Pacific Island and Maori blood now more than we ever have before. We have this rare blood type and it's found in one in every 100 people. That's like two Pacific Island and Maori families. Okay, stop the music. 
This is serious. We currently have three patients here in Australia that are in regular need of this blood. It's being imported from New Zealand because our stocks in Australia are so low. The data shows that we have well over 335,000 Pacific Island and Māori people here in Australia. Not many of us are donating. We need our people to help our people. So all we are asking is for you to reach out through your rugby clubs, your outrigger groups, your netball clubs, choirs, your churches, in the line at KFC, your kapahaka groups, your gossip groups, and you know who they are. Hey, did you see what Sally was wearing to church the other day? I can't believe my eyes. Oh, my horse. This will be Australia's biggest Pacific Island and Māori blood drive. And to help track all this data, we've set up a donation team called Pacific Donors. Yeah, I know. It didn't take me long to think about that one. All you need to do is go to donateblood.com.au, click on Book Now, and register if you haven't already. And when you get to your homepage, just go to My Team and make sure you select... Pacific Donors. Once you've done that, you're pretty much ready to go. Just book an appointment closest to you, and then drop into a centre, say hello, fill in some forms, and then the nurse will ask you some questions. Age? Uh, 25. Real age? 44. And your weight? 80 kilos? Real weight? 135 kilos. Then you take a seat, they hook you up, and before you know it, you're done. You've donated. And now the best part, the recovery station. For one of these, one of these, or even one of these. For a little bit of this, or a lot. I'm just donating blood. Our Pacific Island and Māori people here in Australia need us to boost those stocks so that they don't have to wait. These are our people. We need your help. Keep the culture, brothers and sisters. Keep the culture. So I hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, and again, just to reiterate, if it was any other community, the video would probably have a, a well, will have a completely different feel. Uh, and that's why it's important to work with communities to find the right messaging and the right way to actually talk to their people. Um, and just uh, really to, to finish this up, I want to show you some examples. So this is a Twitter post that, uh, sorry, a Facebook post that was done by a community group during that recruitment phase. Um, and you can see uh, huge numbers of views just on that one post. Um, and uh, they uploaded the video themselves. Um, and it was posted by multiple community groups, all having the same amount of viewings. Um, here's a, a, a picture of a member of parliament in the Australian Capital Territory uh, Territory government. Um, she saw the video uh, of that you just watched. Then um, wanted to know how she could help. So we told her to go um, take some photos of herself donating, um, and gave her some suggestions of things like the having food in the photo, like we've been told was really important in our workshops. Um, she then posted this. This actually then got picked up by the uh, one of the embassies in Australia, who um, then contacted us and are now working with us to run a um, a a donation event for their community in Brisbane. Um, we also really were thrilled when um, the leader of the Australian Wallabies rugby team uh, came out and said, hey, I've seen the videos, I wanna be involved and uh, did his own video um, on Facebook uh, and Twitter and Insta that has gone crazy on there as well of himself donating and talking about our campaign. Um, and that's done really well as well. And Lifeblood then retweeted it uh, and reposted it on the various channels. And it was actually originally posted by the Wallabies own um, their own actual account. So that was an incredible reach right around the world, actually. Uh, this is a, a really wonderful picture. So um, one of the things, as you saw, that they asked us to do was to go and get um, images of their own people in the community donating. So one of our actual SAG members went and rounded up people for us uh, from her community. She went along and helped us have a, um, 
a photo shoot in one of the donor centers in Queensland. Um, and actually one of our staff members heard about it um, and she was Pacific Islander and she's in this image. She actually said, hey, I wanna be involved as well. Um, so it was a real community uh, event. They told us which images are gonna work best for them. We said what we needed to do and what we what would fit in with our brand. And we worked together to create these images and we haven't finalized them yet, but some of them will be coming out hopefully soon. Uh, this one here was actually taken by one of the uh, people at the shoot of someone else um, who was being involved. So it's one of their own shots. And what's fantastic is this guy here came and um, participated in the photo shoot and has subsequently found out that he actually was one of uh, those rare donors um, and took to Instagram to really share that um, and has had a lot of uh, likes and reposts of that particular image. So I guess really, uh, um, what are we doing now? Uh, well, we're taking and implementing those new images of Pacific Island donors and, and we're getting some staff member shots as well, because that's one of the things that was recommended. Um, we're going to email out a special email that we design to those donors who signed up, but who have not actually made an appointment yet. So as you saw, there was many appointments made and blood donations, but there were some that haven't actually gone through and actually made that appointment yet. We're going to design a pamphlet, digital pamphlet, online guide to blood donation, why, what, where and how. Um, and then we're hoping to continue the co-design process after the study ends. And that's one of the recommendations of the groups. They want us to actually continue on um, working with them to do this as a long term uh, project. So um, thank you for uh, joining me today. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use the question facility and I'd, I'd love to hear from you and please get in touch. Um, and I hope your organizations uh, think about doing something like a co-design process if you're looking at working with minority communities. Uh, thank you very much.